So let's talk about Mannerist sculpture. Okay, um, when we're talking about Mannerist sculpture, one thing to keep in mind is that it shares the same basic characteristics as Mannerist painting that we've already discussed. So elegance, complexity. Uh, the more enigmatic and puzzling it is, the better complicated, uh, of extreme sense of sophistication and gracefulness and a demonstration of the artist's skill. Okay. And a great example of that is Benvenuto uh, Cellini's bronze sculpture of Perseus, which he makes from about 1545 to 1554. How and big is this? It's about way? life size and it's on a very tall pedestal and it is located in its original location where it was made for uh, the Piazza della Signoria, uh, the loggia just to the uh, right of the town hall if you're facing its entrance. So it's an important location. It's a very important location and its location is an very important part of its meaning, uh, which we'll talk about. So who commissioned this? This is for Duke Cosimo I, uh, Cosimo de' Medici, who was the first really great powerful of the Medici dukes who rules uh, 16th century Florence. He comes to power in the 1530s and uh, rules up in towards the end of the century. Okay. So the first thing we should talk about is um, what the subject matter is. We'll come back to it again, but generally this is a sculpture of Perseus, and Perseus is a figure from Greek and Roman mythology. He is the hero, uh, in a way a regular guy, who defeats the Gorgon monster Medusa. And Medusa is the uh, terrible sorceress who's so ugly and has snakes for hair that when you look at her you turn to stone because she's so terrible looking. And this was not the way she was born. She was originally very beautiful and seductive, but she tried to seduce Zeus. And so Zeus's wife, Hera, puts this curse on her uh -oh. that makes her so ugly that if she you know, anyone looks at her, they turn to stone. That's her punishment for being seductive. In any case, uh, Perseus goes off to defeat her. And the way that he's able to beat her, even though she has this power to turn people to stone, is that Athena gives him a shield that's very, very highly polished, like a mirror. And so when he goes to fight Medusa, he holds the shield up. She looks at her own reflection. She turns to stone. And still, while he's not looking at her, he reaches out with a sword and slices her head off. He beheads her, but he quickly puts her head in a bag, because even when she's dead, she can turn people to stone. And then he flies off to fight another monster, and he pulls Medusa's head out of the bag and defeats that other beast as well. He's able to fly, by the way, because just like how Athena gave him a shield, the god Mercury, or Hermes, gave him his winged hat and winged sandals that allows him to fly. And we see all of these things in the sculpture. We'll come back to them again. So Perseus is really blessed. He's by helped the gods. by the gods. Yes. He's got the winged sandals here. He's got the winged helmet here. This, of course, is Medusa's decapitated head. Here is her body spurting blood in bronze over here. And the shield is actually what they're all standing and mm. lying on. Uh, you can't see it from this particular angle. Anyway, uh, the story of this particular sculpture, this particular representation of Perseus, is that Cellini had been working in France for King Francis I. Who Leonardo had also worked for. Who Leonardo had worked for some years earlier. And Cellini makes some sculptures for the King of France, but then comes back to his hometown of Florence, where Cosimo de' Medici is the duke. And there are several different versions of the story. Uh, one of the accounts comes from the autobiography that Cellini himself writes in the 1550s. Um, and basically the story is that Cellini approaches the Duke and says, I have a great project that you're going to want to fund and have me make. And he shows the Duke uh, sketches and models made out of clay and wax of this figure. And the Duke likes the subject matter a lot, and we'll come back to why, but um, he likes the idea, and he likes the subject and where it's going to go, but the Duke thinks of himself as an artistic connoisseur. And so he says to Cellini, I like this idea, but it's never going to work, uh, <laughs> because there's several different reasons. That's First, a presumptuous on his part. Well, this is again part of mannerism. Here's a leader of Florence, and he thinks that he's such an artistic expert that he can tell a sculptor what mm -hmm. can and can't be done. Uh, and he says one reason it's not going to work is that it, it's going to topple over. Uh, bronze may be very strong. In other words, a bronze sculpture can stand on its own two feet in a way that marble cannot. Right, marble always needs that sort of tree stump or something. Marble on the is bottom. very brittle. It would never be able to have an arm that sticks out like this that would snap off in marble. It would need some kind of support for the legs. Bronze can do all of that. Um, but the Duke says, look, even though I know bronze can do that, um, this figure is going to tip forward. It's not going to be balanced well. The way you've made it is not going to be stable. And the other thing, more importantly, the Duke says, is that the bronze casting is never going to be successful because 
essentially the way that bronze is made, if we look at a diagram of the bronze casting process, is that you have an inner mold of clay, uh, an outer mold of clay, and then what's in between there is wax in this inner layer that you have made basically in the design of what you want your finished sculpture to be. And then what you do, as you can see on the right, is you pour hot molten bronze in here and everywhere the wax was, which floods out, uh, the bronze then goes. And right. after the bronze cools off, you then break the outer mold and there essentially is your bronze sculpture. And this is called the lost wax process because we lose the wax and, and in exactly, the place it's we get the bronze. by the bronze. So when the Duke looks at Cellini's designs, he said this is never going to work in the bronze casting process because you have so many things sticking out in different directions the arm, the sword, the hands, the feet, that the bronze is not going to flow fast enough to all of these places mm. that it needs to fill. And so when you break open the mold, you're going to find that the cast That's is correct. incomplete, that oh. there are things missing because ah. the bronze didn't get everywhere. It, didn't, it wasn't hot enough. It wasn't fluid enough. Anyway, so Cellini listens to these arguments and he says essentially to the Duke, I am such an expert. I'm such a good sculptor. I can pull it off. You just need to trust me. And so the Duke says, okay, you can go ahead, but I'm warning you, you're going to humiliate yourself. <laughs> and Cellini gets to work. He prepares the mold. He prepares everything the way it needs to be done. And he starts pouring the molten bronze into the mold. But he quickly realizes that, in fact, the Duke was right. The bronze is uh -oh. not flowing fast enough to fill up the whole uh, mold. And so... It needs to be hotter. What he does is he instructs all of his assistants and servants to break all of the wood furniture in his house and throw it on the fire so that the fire will burn hotter and the bronze will run smoother and faster. And they do that and that works, but it's still not fast enough. Uh -oh. And so they throw in some silverware and other kinds of pewter <laughs> things that he has lying around the house because if you add that to the bronze mixture, that also makes it more liquidy. Um, and then they wait with bated breath for the whole thing to cool off and they break it open and there is the whole sculpture complete. He did it. It's a miracle that he was able to do it. He was able to cast it without any flaws. He claims uh, no missing parts like the Duke had said would happen. Uh, and then it needs to be finished off. And then also once it's installed in the pedestal, it, it does in fact stand very firmly so without the, toppling over. This is, you know, I mean, they were, the, you know, bronze casting had been a lost art for the whole Middle Ages virtually, right? And Things was, of this complexity, certainly. Yeah. And so again, even if we without thinking about what the subject matter is, without thinking about how it relates to its surroundings, part of the meaning of this work of art is that Cellini is it. a great sculptor. Right. In other words, that's practically the subject matter, is that he was able to accomplish what was said to be impossible. impossible. And this makes it mannerist. It is a statement of the artist's skill at taking on an artistic an challenge. An amazing virtuosity. And, and that virtuosity is not just in the casting, but it's also in the finishing of this surface, which is incredibly well uh, polished and has a tremendous amount of detail. Of course, it's also mannerist because of the uh, rather lithe, elegant, athletic, slim form that corresponds to the dominant aesthetic of the time. Uh, but again, it's this issue of the artist's skill that's foregrounded that, that makes this in part so important. So was there something you were going to tell us about the patron and about well, where this is? Okay, exactly. So the other part, uh, another part of the sculpture that's so important is how it relates to its setting. And like I said, this is in front of the town hall, in front of the Palazzo della Signoria, where at the time there were already several other sculptures, as we can see in this photo, which is sort of taken from the point of view of where the Perseus is located. In other words, this seems to be what Perseus, Perseus is looking see. at. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, and of course, Although it's now a replica, one of the things that stood there is Michelangelo's, Michelangelo's David. David, where a replica stands in the original's original location. Uh, Michelangelo's David here, and then also this figure of Hercules that was installed a couple of uh, some years later, originally part of a commission by the Republic, uh, but then eventually uh, completed under the Medici themselves. Both of these figures. Michelangelo's David and this figure of Hercules by Bandinelli. Um, in a way, they were symbols of the Republic of Florence. Uh, David, who defeats the stronger beast Goliath, was seen as a symbol of the Republic from even the beginning of the 1400s because it was a symbol of how the good and the weak can defeat the strong if God is on their side. And the 15th century Medici, the Medici of the 1400s, they had um, essentially stolen this imagery away when they had several sculptures of David made. When the Republic expels the Medici in the 1490s and then returns to power in the 1500s, the Republic 
gets this sculpture by Michelangelo in a way as a statement of their return, a statement of their defeat of the Medici. And Hercules, too, in some ways functioned in that role because Hercules was also a symbol of the Republic, uh, the hero who, with the help of gods, is able to defeat stronger enemies. So these are both symbols of Florence as a democracy uh, whose power is in the hands of the citizens of Florence. That was definitely one of and their... And not in the hands of a single family like the Medici. Exactly. And this was always the struggle. This was always part of their meaning, especially that was definitely understood as the primary meaning of yes. Michelangelo's David standing right here. So when we think about Cosimo de Medici, uh, this member of the family who leads the family's triumphant return and taking power back from the Republic, reconquering the city for the Medici. Did they do that violently? Um, not at first, although they were tyrants in some other respects. Um, they do stamp out this short-lived Republic of the beginning of the 1500s. We need to understand the Perseus figure and its commission in this location in that kind of historical context, because when we think of the Perseus standing here, holding up that head of Medusa, what, of course, does it look like has happened here? It looks like uh, it's turned David to stone. It's exactly. turned the, the symbol of the Republic exactly. to stone. It looks as if especially Michelangelo's David is looking right at Cellini's Perseus and the head of Medusa. And there's a suggestion that Hercules is as well, mm -hmm. and that because they're looking at this head of Medusa that's being held up by the triumphant hero, uh, that they have turned to stone. And so the kind of tricky, almost humorous, but very sophisticated, and hence typically mannerist, illusion is that the Medici, with their sculpture of Perseus, have turned these figures representing the Republic into stone and have defeated their enemies once again. You know, it's funny because I think we tend to look at these sculptures as Im you know, images of beautiful figures during the Renaissance, and we forget this really intense political meaning behind them. Absolutely, and we need to understand their historical context, their locations, all of this helps us understand what they are, but in the end they still are also very beautiful objects, and that's another way to understand why these viewers, Hercules and David, have turned to stone, because it was a rather common rhetoric to say that an object could be so beautiful, or an artist's skill could be so beautiful that it um, takes your breath away. Mm. It stops you in your tracks. It petrifies the viewer. Uh, the viewer can be slain by beauty. And so that maybe that's another meaning of these figures turning to stone, is that they look at Perseus's creation, and they're so astonished by his skill and his mastery as an artist that they are turned to stone in astonishment. They're incredibly beautiful.